The availability of a least squares method of fitting ellipses offers a mathematical way of reconstructing the geometry of a Carolina Bay even when only a portion of the bay is visible. This makes it possible to test the hypothesis that the bays were made by wind and water mechanisms against the alternative hypothesis that the bays originated as inclined impact penetration funnels. Welcome to another edition of the Carolina Bay of the Day, where we study the secondary impacts made by the glacier ice boulders that were ejected by one or more extraterrestrial impacts on the Laurentide ice sheet by the Great Lakes. The secondary impacts produce seismic vibrations that liquefy the unconsolidated soil, and the oblique impacts of glacier ice created inclined conical cavities that became shallow elliptical basins by viscous relaxation. In Nebraska, these basins are called rainwater basins, and along the Atlantic coastal plain, they are called Carolina Bays. Today, we will be discussing Herndon Bay, which gained attention after a paper published in 2016 proposed that the bay had migrated 600 meters in a period of 10,000 years. Many geologists think that the Carolina Bays originated as lakes that were shaped by the action of wind and water, commonly called the Aeolian and Lacustrine hypothesis. The precise elliptical geometry of the Carolina Bays is a very important clue about the origin of the bays, but it has not been seriously discussed since the 1950s. Some geologists have doubts about the Aeolian and Lacustrine mechanisms. A university professor with whom I communicated recently said that it does not seem possible that wind and waves can create the elliptical shape, or there would be more evidence of raised rim deposition through time that tracks a transition to more elliptical shapes. He also mentioned that this is particularly true for the small base as there can't be much wave and wind energy in these small basins to move sediment. However, the professor added that once the base formed, he thinks that the data support active deposition of the rim through coastal processes. I am extremely disappointed when I hear that because I know that there are Carolina Bays on the gravel fields of Midlothian, Virginia, which is located 15 kilometers west of Richmond. The terrain is 110 to 120 meters above sea level and 150 kilometers from the Atlantic Ocean. I cannot imagine what kind of coastal process could have created Carolina Bays on top of these gravel hills. The gravel clasts are too big and heavy to be moved by wind and wave action to create these basins. Also, the study of the Carolina Bays cannot be complete without mentioning the Nebraska rainwater basins, which have the same elliptical characteristics. The basins in Nebraska are 500 to 600 meters above sea level on terrain that has not been close to any sea for more than 60 million years. No coastal processes could have formed these basins. The Nebraska basins are never mentioned in discussions about the Aeolian and Lacustrine origins of the Carolina Bays or the fact that the basins in Nebraska and on the East Coast have their major axes radially oriented toward the Great Lakes. The Aeolian and Lacustrine mechanisms are discussed in a paper published in 2016 by Moore and five co-authors titled The Quaternary Evolution of Herndon Bay, a Carolina Bay on the Coastal Plain of North Carolina, USA. Implications for Paleoclimate and Oriented Lake Genesis The abstract of the paper says, Geological Investigations of Herndon Bay, a Carolina Bay in the coastal plain of North Carolina, USA, provide evidence for rapid basin scour and migration during marine isotope stage MIS-3 of the late Pleistocene. LiDAR data show a regressive sequence of sand rims that partially backfill the remnant older portions of the bay, with evidence for basin migration more than 600 meters to the northwest. The paper says that single-grain optically stimulated luminescence dating plays the formation of the rims starting at about 37,000 years ago to about 27,000 years ago. These ages indicate that migration and rim construction was coincident with marine isotope stage 3 through early marine isotope stage 2, which was a time of rapid oscillations in climate. The fact that Carolina Bay basins can migrate yet maintain their characteristic shape and orientation demonstrates that Carolina Bays are oriented lakes that evolved over time through lacustrine and aeolian processes. Figure 11 of the paper describes the influence of prevailing southwesterly and seasonally westerly and northwest winds on Carolina Bay formation, orientation, and sand rim construction. 
Prevailing winds out of the southwest produce water circulation, orientation, basin scour, and rim construction, the blue sand rims, along the northeast margin, while seasonal winds out of the west or northwest redistribute northeastern rim sediments into prominent southeastern sand rims, the brown sand rims, but do not reorient bay basins. The text of the article says that Carolina bays evolve over many millennia in the same way that a meandering river migrates through, reworks, and erases evidence of former channels. Evidence of multiple sand rims and bay migration demonstrate this explanation most clearly. Thus, a catastrophic origin is neither supported by geological data nor needed to explain features attributed to the Carolina bays. This LiDAR image shows Herndon Bay in context with other bays around it. The paper by Moore and his co-authors claims that Herndon Bay migrated 600 meters from 37 to 27,000 years ago. This brings up the question of what happened to the neighboring bays. Did they also migrate 600 meters during those 10,000 years? It doesn't seem likely many bays do not have multiple sand rims. This is a satellite image of the same area. In order for wind and wave action to create the Carolina Bays, all this terrain would have been covered by thousands of lakes of all sizes, but there is no evidence of that. Most of the landscape in the image has been urbanized or turned into farmland. There are few bays that are undisturbed, but there is one on the far left of this image. A closer look reveals that the Carolina Bays are generally covered with dense vegetation. It is not possible for water to circulate freely or for the wind to carry much sand when there is so much undergrowth. It does not seem reasonable to expect that 37 to 27,000 years ago, this land was completely covered with lakes where the water could circulate freely to produce elliptical bays. The corresponding LiDAR image shows that well-preserved Carolina bays have a precise elliptical geometry and raised rims, which are made by the compressive forces of a projectile passing through a viscous medium. The paper by Moore illustrates a model of Carolina Bay formation and migration based on earlier models by Kaczorowski, 1977, and data from Herndon Bay. The plan view shows cumulative erosion and deposition of sediments by water circulation and the eolian transport due to prevailing southwest winds and seasonal winds from the west and northwest respectively. The bay cross section shows erosion on the northwest side of the lake and rim building on the southeast side of the lake created by wave action. This detailed image of the plan view shows wind from three directions, the northwest, the west and the prevailing wind from the southwest. The cross-section view shows erosion and sand deposition caused by a subaqueous circulation cell and the prevailing southwest wind. The authors say, quote, Through the use of wind table modeling, Kaczorowski demonstrated that strong prevailing winds from the southwest in the Carolinas were responsible for creating circulation cells that shaped natural depressions into ellipses and oriented bays perpendicular to prevailing wind. Dual circulation cells, scoured basins, and eroded opposite ends of the basin perpendicular to directional winds while depositing eroded sediment on the downwind side of the basin, northeast in the Carolinas. These wind patterns were also responsible for producing sand rims which are typically shoreline lacustrine features composed of both water lane and aeolian deposits. Sand rims form primarily along the northeastern and southeastern portions of Carolina Bays in the Carolinas. Multiple rims and variable sand rim placement around bays indicate variable wind directions may have been involved in rim formation. End quote. The authors state that the lakes originated from natural depressions and that circulation cells powered by the wind gave the bays their elliptical shape. The proposed migration of Herndon Bay from 37 to 27,000 years ago is almost like that of a sailboat tacking into the wind. It is important to note that Kaczorowski's 1977 report was never published in a peer-reviewed journal and that the pointy shape of the pull from his experiment is not elliptical but resembles a bloated American football. However, in his report, Kaczorowski wrote that the model lake changed shape from circular to elliptical. I digitized the resulting shape produced by Kaczorowski's experiment. The sample points are shown here as red dots. Fitting an ellipse to these points using the least squares method shows that the structure is not elliptical at all. 
The deviation from the elliptical geometry in Kacharovsky's experimental structure is visualized better by using pink on the parts of the structure that are outside of the ellipse and green on the parts where the structure falls short of the ellipse. Kacharovsky's wind and water experiment definitely did not produce an elliptical structure as claimed in his report or as stated in the paper by Moore. This LiDAR image shows Herendon Bay and the sequence of sand rims which according to the authors were deposited from 37 to 27,000 years ago. The authors write, quote, Basin migration was punctuated by periods of stability and construction of a regressive sequence of sand rims with basal muddy sands incorporated into the oldest rims. End quote. The ancient Greeks knew that ellipses are conic sections. Mathematically, it follows that inclined conical cavities will look elliptical when seen from above. Oblique impacts of ice projectiles on viscous ground produce penetration funnels with raised rims whose depth decreases by viscous relaxation to produce shallow elliptical basins. Melton and Shriver in 1933 and Prounty in 1952 suggested that the elliptical geometry of the Carolina base was best explained by meteorite impacts, but no meteoritic material was found in the base. The discovery of the Nebraska rainwater basins and the radial convergence of the basins by the Great Lakes made it possible to propose that the basins were created by secondary impacts of glacier ice ejected by an extraterrestrial impact on the Laurentide ice sheet. The hypothesis of a large extraterrestrial impact at the Younger Dryas boundary 12,900 years ago was deemed highly unlikely and it became a very controversial topic, but in 2013, evidence of a platinum anomaly from an extraterrestrial source provided solid evidence that an extraterrestrial impact had indeed occurred. We will now examine the geometry of Herendon Bay and the sand rims that are supposed to be evidence of its migration. This image shows the sample points of the perimeter of Herndon Bay and the result of fitting an ellipse by the least squares method. The graph shows that the sample points are precisely along the elliptical curve and that no point is too far outside or inside the ellipse. This is a more exact fit than we observed for Kaczorowski's experiment. The major axis measures 1,101 meters and the minor axis measures 672 meters. Mathematically, only five points are needed to define the path of an ellipse. Since well-preserved Carolina bays are elliptical, we can determine the characteristics of a bay that is partially obscured. In this case, we sample the coordinates along a rim that was characterized as a remnant of the migration of Herndon Bay. The resulting ellipse has a major axis of 780 meters and a minor axis of 533 meters, which is a lot smaller than Herndon Bay. This could not be a remnant rim of Herndon Bay migration unless the bay shrank and then expanded again. The rim located 600 meters away from Herndon Bay was considered by Moore's paper to be the original location of the bay from which the migration started. Only a portion of this rim is visible, but we can take sample points along the perimeter to get the characteristics of the elliptical basin. This ellipse is slightly smaller than Herndon Bay, but bigger than the ellipse for the intermediate rim. The migration hypothesis becomes less credible because a large bay has to become smaller and then bigger again. Fitting ellipses to Herndon Bay in the partially overlaid rims gives us a new perspective based on the geological law of superposition. First, an oblique impact by a glacier ice boulder created a penetration funnel with a major axis of 1,081 meters. Next, a second smaller oblique impact created an inclined conical cavity with a major axis of 780 meters. Finally, a larger ice projectile produced a conical cavity that formed Herndon Bay. This ellipse had a major axis of 1,101 meters. Something not mentioned in Moore's paper was the small base along the margin of the first large one. Little details should not be ignored. The migration story cannot account for this small base. These small impact basins were created by small pieces of glacier ice with very high ballistic trajectories and they impacted the ground after the bigger base had formed. Herndon Bay is located 1,111 kilometers from Lake Michigan, which is assumed to be the point from which the ice boulder that made this basin was launched. The basin has a width of 672 meters and a length of 1,101 meters. The width-to-length ratio corresponds to an impact angle of 37.6 degrees. 
The diameter of the glacier ice projectile that made this basin is estimated to be 220 meters, which is one-fifth of the basin length. The ballistic equations indicate that the glacier ice boulder that made Herndon Bay was launched at a speed of 3.358 kilometers per second. It had a flight time of 6.96 minutes and reached a height of 214 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. The trajectory was a suborbital spaceflight in the vacuum of space. The kinetic energy of the impact that made Herndon Bay was equivalent to 6.9 megatons of TNT, which would have caused seismic vibrations of magnitude 8.0. The interpretation of the features of the Carolina Bays will continue to be contested based on the dates, the morphology, and the law of superposition. However, the application of the least squares method for fitting ellipses to Carolina Bays is a new analytical tool that will help to settle many questions. Thank you for joining me in the investigation of the Carolina Bays and the Younger Dryas Cataclysm. I will continue to examine the Carolina Bays one bay at a time. My book about the Carolina Bays is available at Amazon. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel to be notified of future videos about the Carolina Bays.